2 Chronicles chapter 10, 2 Chronicles chapter 10. I want to teach this morning on the power of agreement. The power of agreement. I encourage you to grab your, uh, your, your phone, your notes, Multiply Family app, a lot of scripture, a lot of, lot of content. It'll be on the screen, but that'll help you to follow, follow along. So we made this statement last week, and I want to kind of preach on the, the other nuance or, or take or ex- extrapolate the other nuance of this statement. It was said, my, my experience is kind of a basic underlying tenet of psychology is that my experience is what I agree to attend to. My experience is what I agree to attend. You've experienced that in your own home. You've you've walked out of the same church service of somebody that you've been sitting beside. This person's perspective is here. The other person's perspective, like it was the same worship, the same sermon, the same, and one person walked down like, oh, that one, I didn't get much. And the other person is just tears running down their eyes. Like it was the same, but oftentimes in life, right? And that can be a sporting event. That can be a restaurant. That can be a movie. That can be a meal, many, many things in life that our experience is what we agree to attend to. There is such power in agreement. When I ask you a couple of questions, the first question would be this, what words forward declaring direction and destiny, forward declaring direction and destiny, what words in your life are you living in agreement with? What words in your life are you living in agreement with? There's a man by the name of Jim Quick. Jim tells the story when he was in kindergarten. There were sirens outside of his classroom, and kindergartners can't help themselves, so they jump up and run to the window, and Jim says, I was too short to see out the window, so he grabs a chair. He goes to stand on the chair, and all of the commotion, the chair gets knocked out from under him. Some of you will remember up north the old metal radiators, and he falls forward and hits his head against one of those radiators. He, they rush him to the hospital. The external injuries aren't too severe, but the internal injuries were pretty severe. Jim's mom said this about him. He, he, she said that he was, never, he was never quite the same after that moment. She said, as a young boy up until that moment, full of energy, he was confident, he was curious. But now, and he describes, he says, he says I just kind of shut down. I had difficulty learning. It was hard to focus. He would ask his teachers to repeat things until it got to the point where it was embarrassing, and then he just pretended like he got it and moved on. It says one time in, in high school, he was falling so far behind, the teacher gave him extra credit, and he wrote a report on Einstein and was actually excited because it was helping him to catch up in the class, brought that report into class, and the teacher said, I've got a surprise for you. Jim has an extra credit assignment. He's not just going to turn it in. He's going to read it in front of the class, and he was so paralyzed with fear, he lied to the teacher and said, I didn't do it. Walks and throws it in the trash can. Jim said, and teachers are amazing. 95% of teachers are absolutely amazing. Maybe this teacher, I'm not blaming, maybe this teacher was good. Maybe it was out of frustration, but words were said. Jim walked by a teacher, and he heard, a, overheard a teacher say to somebody else, oh, that's the boy with the broken brain. For the rest of his life, Jim began to agree with those words that were spoken about him. I can't read. I've got, I'm the boy with the broken brain. I can't learn. I'm the boy with the broken brain. I can't give the report in front of my class. I'm the, I'm the boy with the broken brain. He says, somehow I graduated from high school and then miracle of all miracles, I I, I somehow got into college. And he was actually a little bit excited about this because this was a chance to start over. He said, nobody knows me as the boy with the broken brain. They just are going to know me as Jim. And so he tried so hard for this fresh start, two months into it, failing every class. He said, I'm wasting my time and I'm wasting my money. One of his friends said they were, had a fall break, said, come with me. Just, he thought that getting off campus would help him out. And so Jim went to the friend's house, walked in the door. The friend's father was just making small talk. Hey, boys. He looks at Jim. How's school going? That one simple question. Jim said, I lost it. He said, I broke down. I started bawling. I started sobbing. The friend's dad, a little bit taken aback. He wasn't expecting that kind of a response. But he said, he brought him into the kitchen. He, he sat him down. He said, Jim, I want you to, he said, I want you to answer these three questions. Who do you want to be? What do you want to do? And what difference do you want to make in the world? 
Who do you want to be? What do you want to do? And what difference do you want to make in the world? Jim started writing a little bit later. His friend's dad takes the paper and starts reading through the paper, looks at Jim, and he said, Jim, you are, he held his fingers about 12 inches apart. He said, you're this close. You're actually this close to achieving everything that you want in life. He said, follow me. He took Jim back into his library and he started pulling some books off of the shelf. Books about changing your mindset. He said, Jim, I want you to read. I want you to promise me that you'll read one of these books every single week. Jim was already following behind, following behind in every one of his classes, but he said, I'll do it. I'll do it. And he started reading those books. And as he did, Jim said, something happened. Something changed in my mind. He said, I, I was still bear, struggling to read, struggling to comprehend. But he said, I realized that I didn't have a broken brain. My brain was just different. He said, I realized that there were different ways to learn. And so we started studying all of these different, some people are auditory, some people are visual, some people are hands-on. And so he gathered all of this information. Fast forward today, Jim Quick, you can Google his name, K-W-I-K, has helped over 150,000 people around the world. He's helped the learning disabled, seniors struggling with brain aging challenges. He's created schools from Guatemala to Kenya. He's a brain coach to top of the field people in sports, entertainment, CEOs, educated, educators. He's a New York Times best-selling author because he made the decision in his life, I'm not going to live in agreement with those words anymore. I'm not the boy with the broken brain. I learn differently. I learn differently. Here's an, so here's my second question. Let me keep pushing. What limits have you placed on yourself because of wrong words you've been living in agreement with? What limits have you placed on yourself because of wrong words that you've been living in agreement with? Words matter. Our experience is what we agree to attend to, and living in agreement with words changes our life. Let me show you this from Scripture. 2 Chronicles chapter 10. The story is this. David had passed on the throne to his son Solomon. Solomon was a great king until he wasn't. And he married wrong, and that's a whole sermon there. He married wrong and too many. Like a thousand is a little bit too many. And so he's got all of these idols in the land. He starts chasing after the wrong idols, and he passes that on to Rehoboam, his son. And God said, Rehoboam, I'm going to split the kingdom because of your father. And Rehoboam steps into this moment. You can decide, I don't no, I don't know where you're at theologically on this. Did Rehoboam inherit something that was absolute or did Rehoboam have a choice? I won't give you the answer. You figure it out and you tell me. But here's the account. I'll just read the scripture and preach from the scripture. Verse 1, Rehoboam went to Shechem where all Israel had gathered to make him king. At that point, this is important, when Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he returned to Egypt, for he had fled to Egypt to escape from King Solomon, and, and the leaders of Israel summoned him in. So up until that point, verse 1, where all had Israel had gathered. So Israel was unified up until that point. Verse 3. The leaders of Israel summoned him and Jeroboam and all the leaders and said, we want to speak with you. Your father was hard. They said, he was smart, it was really hard. Said, lighten the labor. We got heavy taxes, then we will be your loyal subjects. And Rehoboam said, come back in three days. Give me three days. So the people went away. Then Rehoboam discussed the matter with the older man who had counseled his father, Solomon, other than Jesus Christ, small, smartest man, most wise man to ever walk the planet. And so we assumed that he had pretty good counselors as well. So Rehoboam discussed the matter with the older man. What's your advice? How should I answer these people? The older counselors said, if you're good to these people, do your best to please them. Give them a favorable answer. They will always be your loyal subjects. I wonder... I wonder, this is my hypothesis, was God giving Rehoboam a second chance? Was there an opportunity for grace there? But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older men and insisted that the opinion of the young men who he had grown up with were now his advisors. What's your advice, he asked them. How should I answer these people who want me to light the bur burdens imposed by my father? The young man replied, this is what you should tell those complainers, they just want a lighter burden, tell them my finger 
is lighter than your father's waist. My father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. Tell your neighbor, I may have gotten the belt, but at least I didn't get the scorpions. <laughs> Three days later, chair boom. And I can tell everybody who's got the belt, though, you're all well behaved this morning. Thank you. I just want to thank your parents. I'll st stop, stop, Doug. Stay focused. Stay focused. Stay focused. Just as the king had ordered, just read the, read the word. But Rehoboam spoke harshly to him, for he rejected the advice of the older counselors and followed the counsel of his younger advisors. He told the people, my father laid heavy. I'm going to make them heavier. My father beat you with whips. I'm going to beat you with scorpions. So the king paid no attention to the people. This turn of events was the will of God, for it fulfilled the Lord's message to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh. And when all Israel realized that the king had refused to listen to them, they responded down with the dynasty of David, even though God had said, David, you will never fail to have a son on the throne. They joined their words, not with the words of the Lord, but with their own desires. Down with the dynasty, words matter. Down with the dynasty of David. We have no interest in the son of Jesse. Back to your homes. Look out for your own house, O oh David. What words you choose to listen to matter. What words you choose to allow into your head, into your heart, matter. The, the, the course of an entire nation, generations, kingdoms were, were divided because Rehoboam listened and agreed with the wrong words. Let me give you some things from the scriptures this morning. To live in agreement with the right words. To live in agreement with the right words. Number one, you've got to understand the difference between words from the enemy and words from God. This is, this is harder than it sounds because the devil throws his voice. The thing about the devil is that often words from the devil don't sound like the opposite of what God said. They sound almost like what God said. And so what you have to do is you not only have to listen to what is said, but you have to listen to the tone, right? When you're, when you're responding to the text message, when do you put the phone down? As soon as you feel emotion, you put the phone down and you say, I'm going to wait on that. <laughs> I'm going to have a face-to-face -face conversation because not everything is just the words. It's the emotion behind the words. And so what the devil will do to you is he will say things to you and then he will try to make you think that those thoughts that you're thinking are actually God thoughts. Verse 10, the young men replied, this is what you should tell those complainers, lighter burden. And then the, he says, yes, my father said heavy burdens. I'm going to make them heavier. And then the punishment. So I put this on your notes. Here's what words from the enemy sound like. They sound like heavy burdens, disapproval, and punishment. Heavy burdens, disapproval, and punishment. In other words, this is what the enemy's voice sounds like. I'm going to burden you. I'm not pleased with you. You deserve to be punished. But does the enemy try to get you to think that those are the enemy's words? No. The enemy tries to get you to think that those are God's words. I'm not pleased with you. I'm going to lay a heavy burden. You think the past month is going to be hard? Just wait. February is going to be even harder. You think 2020 was hard? 2020. How many of you heard these words like God is just mad at you and he's waiting to lay a heavier burden on you that's why you cannot combat the words of the enemy with your own emotions you got to combat the words of the enemy like Jesus did with the word of God you got to say that doesn't sound like my God because Jesus says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Take my burden upon you. And the enemy is trying to get some of you to actually believe that God is mad at you, that he wants to punish you, that he wants to bring heavy burdens on you. You've got to align the words of God with the character of God. The voice of God always sounds like the character of God. I know I'm getting all fired up and yelling and spitting, but God's probably not yelling and spitting at you. Why, why do I get so fired up about this? Because you would not, I'm, I'm telling you, you would not believe 
the number of Christians that love God, that come to me telling me things that they think that God is telling them that sounds like punishment and condemnation. I'm telling you, I break that agreement with those words in the name of Jesus. Hear me, the word of God sounds like the character of God. What is the character of God? First John 4, 7, and 8. I remember that because of the song. Anybody remember that song? First John 4, 7, salty? No? All right, one person, two people. Come on, can I get a witness in the house? But I know that it says God is love. What does love sound like? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude. Again, how many people that I've heard that think that God is speaking to them in a way that sounds rude? God can't do that because it's against his character. Does God correct? Of course he does. Does God call to repentance? Of course he does. But the Bible says it is the kindness of the Lord that draws to repentance. This is what God's voice sound like. The older counselors replied, if you're good to these people and do your best to please them, goodness, pleasing, give them a favorable answer, they will always be loyal, loyalty. I see goodness in there. I see a lighter burden. I see pleasing, I see favor, I see loyalty. I believe God is saying to somebody, I'm good to you. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, I'm pleased with you. I wanna bring favor upon you. I will never leave you or forsake you. John 10, 27, my sheep know me and they know my voice. Can I encourage you, learn, learn, learn your shepherd's voice. Not just what he says, but how he says it. That's so important. What he says, you learn what he says by reading and memorizing the word of God. You learn how he says it by listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit and aligning it with the word of God. That's really good teaching. If you don't say amen, I'm going to hop in the audience and amen myself. I'm going to amen myself. David encouraged himself in the Lord. I'm just encouraging myself in the Lord. Number two, to live in agreement with the right words, understand the difference between what is popular and wise. Verse eight, but Rehoboam rejected the vice of the elders, of the people with the grayer hair, and he asked the opinion of the young men. I don't, I don't think that that's by accident that the older generation had wise advice and the younger generation was just spewing off some stuff. We've gone from looking for the fountain of youth to worshiping at the altar of the fountain of youth. Let, let me say it like this. Everybody that is under the age of 25, can I just so make this applicable to, to 2024? Please, your pastor is asking you, um, please do not take relationship advice from this young lady. No, listen, hold, hold on, hold on, let, let, me, let me explain. I, I know there's controversy, I don't know. Like, I don't know, I don't listen to her music, I don't know if she's a good person, I, I have no idea. Here's all I'm saying, here's all I'm saying. She's never been married. That's like asking for financial advice from somebody that's broke. That's like going up to somebody has just had their 12th triple bypass. Hey, could you give me some eating advice? Like, this is, this is not good. She's made a fortune on writing songs about breaking up. So, like, I don't, y'all, I don't know. Maybe she's a good musician. Maybe she's a good person. But please don't take relationship advice from somebody that has never been married. If you want to be married and be full of joy and have lasting peace and goodness in your home, get Mama and Papa, take them to Cracker Barrel, buy them some biscuits and gravy, and over the second cup of coffee, say, teach me some stuff. Impart into me. We need wisdom. And if you're going to live your life according to what's popular, then you're going to go the direction of what's popular. And I'm telling you, it'll last about 18 months. One of my, did I ever tell you this? I got some 
I'll, I've got all these memories. I've got some former youth students in the, in the house today, and so I was bringing up all these old youth pastor stories. I was cleaning after service, and I f- found a note, and uh, you know how you used to write, like, D plus C equals true love forever. You, you know, you'd write, write that. This one, it was the most honest teenage note I've ever found in my life. It said, J plus K equals true love for now. That's what, that's what it... <laughs> That's what it said. I was like, at least, at least they're honest. <laughs> to, live in, to live in agreement with the right words, number three, understand the difference between advice and opinion. Do you notice that in verse 8 too? But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the older man and he asked the opinion of the young man. There's a big difference between advice and opinion. Can I just say that most of the words out there are not advice, they're opinion. They're clothed in advice, but it's actually just opinion. And if you don't learn to separate them, then you will live your life according to what somebody else wants you to live your life for that will probably be for their benefit, not yours. And that's the key. That's the difference. Advice has your best interests in mind. Opinion has their best interest in mind. So not only do you have to listen to what the words say, you have to look for the tone behind the words. And then one more step, you got to look for motive. God, show me the motive. Give me discernment. How do you get discernment? Two places, according to scripture. One, the Lord gives wisdom and discernment to those who ask, and he gives it generously. And from who? Our elders. Those two places. Let me, let me teach, let me go in a little bit deeper on this, because if we, if we fully understand the depth and the gravity of the power of agreement when it comes to words, I think what's going to happen is you're going to realize some things the Lord's going to reveal some things that you've been living in agreement with, maybe, maybe accidentally. And then what I really feel at the end of this service, you're going to break limitations. The Lord's going to break limitations that have been on your life. There have been things that, like, you'll get to a certain place financially, and it's like, it's like you can't. It, church, church world, they always talk about the 200 barrier. You know, all of the old, man, it's hard, it's hard to break 200. There's, there's, there are things in your life that you just can't seem to break through. And I don't know what that is for you. I don't know what your, I don't know what, this is what I feel the Lord saying. I don't know what your ceiling is, but your ceiling is about to become your floor of the next. God's going to remove You're going to renounce words that you've been living in agreement with, and you're going to agree with the right words, and you're going to experience breakthrough in just a moment. But let let me teach on this power. Number one, just because words are spoken, if you get this, it'll change you. Just because words are spoken doesn't mean that you have to agree with them. So somebody may have spoken words to you. Maybe they were mean-spirited. Maybe it was by accident. Maybe they didn't mean it that way at all. Maybe you overheard something. Or maybe, and here's the really tough thing, sometimes things can even be phrased in spiritual, like it's a prophetic thing like that. And, and again, maybe they're trying, but you know in your spirit, like, ah, that just wasn't for me. That was off. But we can accidentally start living in agreement with these words. So let me, let me teach you how powerful this is. Deuteronomy 19.15 says this, that a matter must be established, established is the key word there, by two or three witnesses. So what does that mean? That means that in the Old Testament, this is a, in a court of law, somebody couldn't say whatever they want and that be enacted as truth. Does that make sense? It had to be established by two or three witnesses. Pastor, that's Old Testament. Let's go to New Testament. 1 Timothy 5.19. It says, don't entertain an accusation unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. 2 Corinthians 13.1. Every matter must be established by two or three witnesses. Now, the context of this is in legal matters and 
excuse me, matters of church discipline, but the principle applies across multiple applications. For something to be established in your life, it requires your agreement. Somebody can't just carelessly say words and they get into your head and get into your heart. You have to act. So let me say it like this. Words, negative words are parasitic. They need a host. And you have to invite them in through your agreement. And then once you agree with those words, they become established. And then it starts affecting your thought patterns, your emotions, and you begin to live out of that. But here's the good news is that if you can step into agreement with negative words, you can step out of agreement with those negative words. Number two is this. You have the power to establish God's word in your life by agreeing with it. Luke 138, it's one of my favorite scriptures. So let's go back to Christmas time. The Holy Spirit overshadows Mary. The voice of the angel says you will become with child through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now pause, let's imagine 13-year-old Mary and all of the words that are going through her head. I'm going to uh, I'm going to be cast out. I'm going to have to break my engagement, my par- like all of these words, all of these thoughts, all of these thought bubbles just running running through her head. But what does she do? How does she respond to it? She doesn't respond out of words of fear. She doesn't agree with those words. I love this prayer in Luke 138. She says this, "May your word to me be fulfilled," Mary responded. "I am the Lord's servant. May everything that you have said about me come true." That's a good scripture to memorize. That's a short one. That's a good, I'm going to memorize that this week. I am the, the devil tries to bring you something against you. He tries to remind you of something. No, I'm the Lord's, I, you remember, you remember those, those tests or those surveys where you can check the box, strongly disagree? I, devil, I, I strongly disagree. I am the Lord's servant. May everything that he said about me, something bad's going to happen to you. I strongly disagree. I am the Lord's servant. May everything he has said about me come true. De- the devil said, again, how's the devil talking to Mary? That's going to be a burden. That blessing's going to turn into a burden. Mary, you can't carry that. You don't have the strength to carry that. You don't have the will to carry that. You don't have the, you don't have the ability to carry that. That may be true, devil, but I, I'm not going to agree with you. There's a third person in this equation who I'm going to agree with. It's called the voice of the Holy Spirit who's already inside of me. He's the comforter. He's the paraclete. He's already speaking agreement with the word of God in your life and over your destiny. So all you got to do is say, God, I agree with, I agree with the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit is speaking over me. I am the Lord's servant. May everything that you have said about me come true. Did anybody catch where? So let's go back to our boy Rehoboam. He's got words of blessing over here and words of cursing over here. Did you catch where this was? What town was it in? Shechem. Why was, that, why was that important? Because you got to go all the way back to the end of Joshua. At the end of Joshua, Joshua was getting ready to pass from this life to the next. And so he gathered all of Israel together at Shechem. And Joshua laid out all the blessings on this side. And he laid out all of the curses on this side. And he said, okay, Israel, we got words of blessing and we've got words of cursing. Which are you going to agree with? What words, what are you going to agree with in your words, in your declaration, in your lifestyle? Why was that important for Joshua to do that? Because a generation before, Moses gathered all of the people. Guess where? At Shechem. Shechem geographically was this small little valley and it stood between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And the Lord did that as a prophetic picture for Israel. And he said, I want you to look to Mount Gerizim. And this is all of the blessings of the Lord. The Lord said, if you follow all of my commands, that I will bless you. The strong nations will bow to you. He, sa- he said, your bread baskets will be full. Your fruit baskets will be full. He said, your children will be blessed. Your towns will be blessed. Your field will be blessed. Enemies will attack you from one direction, but they'll go running and scattered in seven. He said, your storehouses will all be full. Do you agree with this? Or then he, he said, I want you to look over here to Mount Ebal. And Mount Ebal represents 
represents all of the curse. What words in your life are you going to agree with? The The rest, this is not a statement of hyperbole. The rest of Israel's existence depended on which words they chose not only to speak their agreement with, but to walk their agreement, right? Agreeing is more than speaking. Agreeing starts with speaking, but then you got to walk it out. It says, if you obey all the commands of the Lord. So back to, back to Joshua. Then Joshua summoned all of the tribes of Israel at Shechem. This, I, I, believe you, I believe for a Shechem moment in your life this morning. As we draw nearer and nearer to crossover, I believe for a Shechem moment at Multiply Church where God says, I want to bless you beyond your wildest dreams, but you got to agree with me. You can't walk in the curse, or are you going to continue, or are you going to agree with curses in your life? Then Joshua summoned all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. He said, choose this day whom you will serve. But he go he, he, he goes ahead and makes his prophetic declaration. He doesn't, I love, I love that Joshua doesn't wait for somebody else to decide for him what he's going to do. He said, before you decide, before I even hear your decision, he says, I already made up my mind. He said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Before my day starts, but as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord today. I'm going to walk in his blessing. I'm going to walk in his favor. I'm going to walk in his anointing. I'm going to walk in his power. I choose blessing. I choose to align myself with the witness of the Holy Spirit. There have been words, you're like somebody out there, you're like, this makes sense because somebody said something to me and my spirit didn't bear witness to it. And you said your spirit, but it was really the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit, you're now going to witness according to the witness of the Holy Spirit. And two of you are going to disagree with that word and it's gonna fall like dust over your life. It's not gonna have any power. You're going to step into agreement as for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. And then the people answered, because people will follow strong leadership. In uncertain days, people are looking for radical obedience to Jesus Christ, and they will follow you. But they will not follow somebody who's half-hearted. They will not follow somebody who's back and forth. They're not going to follow somebody who's wishy-washy. So we need Joshua's to stand up in this culture and just say, before the decision even makes, here's my decision. But as for me and my house, you're not going to have any problem. You're going to have less problem-making decisions decisions in your life because you already made your decision. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to stand firm. We're going to stand strong. And then the rest of the people said, but the people answered us too. We're in. We will serve the Lord. Verse 22, you are a, there's that word again, witness to your own decision. Joshua said, you have chosen to serve the Lord. So, so watch this. You want to you see how strong words are? Look at this. What did their words lead to? So Joshua made a covenant. A covenant. Our words, what we choose to agree with, becomes a covenant that we live out of in our lives. We don't fully understand the power of covenant in, in America and in the West. The, the closest thing that we have is marriage and as a society we made a mess of that but even just just think to the the best of marriage is that somebody two people come forward and they do what they start again it's got to be more than words I, I get all of that but it starts with words it starts with vows and they step into agreement with who with each other and third witness three yeah By their words, they align their declaration with each other and with the Lord, and they step into covenant. 
How many of you understand that who you bring into your life as a covenant partner affects every other part of your life? So now do you understand the, po the power of whether we choose to align our agreement with blessings or curses? <laughs> curses are gonna fall, fall off of you. They're hanging by a thread. Devil didn't want you to hear this teaching this morning. Everybody, everybody stand, everybody stand. I heard a, I heard a comedian do a, do a bit, you know, when you're trying, you're getting ready to delete an app on your phone and you hard press and all the, all the apps just start shaking. That's what, all those negative words over you, they're shaking. They're like, oh, we're about to go, aren't we? We're about to, we're about to be deleted. Yeah, they are. They are. Through what? Through the power of your words. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you in a simple prayer. I'm going to tell you, let me do this. Let me tell you the prayer that you're going to pray before I just have you blindly repeat something. Is that fair? That's probably fair. That's probably more preacher fair than just repeat after me. And you're just yelling stuff. All right. Here's what we're going to pray. We're going to pray, I repent of all my sins. I renounce all unholy alliances and break any agreements. You feel, you feel that already? In my mind body, soul, and spirit, they are null and void in Jesus' name. Sound like a good prayer? Let's pray this together. Repeat, repeat this prayer after me. Say, I repent of all my sins. I renounce all unholy alliances and break any agreements in mind, body, soul, and spirit. They are null and void in Jesus name and now I want you to pray Mary's prayer say I am the Lord's servant may everything he said about me come true say that again say I am the Lord's servant may everything he said about me come true now I want you to step into the fullness of the blessing of Deuteronomy 28. Let's put these words on the screen. Deuteronomy 28, beginning at verse 3. And we're going to substitute instead of your, we're going to say my. Say my. Verse, we're going to read this together. Say my towns and fields will be blessed. My children and my crops will be blessed. The offspring of my herds and flocks will be blessed. My fruit basket and breadboard will be blessed. Wherever I go and whatever I do, I will be blessed. Verse 6 again, wherever I go and whatever I do will be blessed. Wherever I go and whatever I do will be blessed. Somebody lift your hands and worship the Lord. With heads still bowed and eyes closed, maybe some of you would say, Pastor, I've been living in agreement with the sin in my life, and I've never agreed with the cross. I've never agreed with Jesus. Right now, you can change your life from a life of living under a curse to a life of living under a blessing. As I pray this prayer out loud, I just want you to pray it silently in your heart. Just say something like this. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I come to the cross. I, I repent of my sin. I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart and come into my life and help me to live wide awake to the love of God and fully alive to my purpose. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Come on, can we celebrate, church, with those who went from death to life today? Well, I hope the service made a difference in your life. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus, we would love to know. All you have to do is download the app and click Next Steps. We have resources we'd love to give you as you begin your journey in following Him. So? It's Sunday. And it's the first week of February. We made it through January. <clears throat> See you next week.